Thanks. So, my name is uh, Johan Lindorka. I'm from RISE Research Institute of Sweden. I'm a researcher and. Per Patron, I'm from the municipality of Sonsvall and also a PhD student here in Gothenburg. Um, so, I think this presentation is a product of long term uh, discussions uh, back and forth. Uh, it really aligns with at least my, one, my passion with both open source and the challenges that presented in the municipal context uh, where there's a lot of challenges as we will see uh, but also a lot of opportunities for collaborating and adopting open source. But uh, first, Ted is going to start off. Uh, yes, some lesson learned from uh, e-service platform called OpenE Platform. Uh, which is marketed uh, as uh, an e-service platform completely in open source, which kind of is correct in one sense. Uh, the background, uh, it's an e-service platform under the APDL version 3 uh, license, established in 2014 uh, within a European Union uh, found an innovation project uh, with the vendor together with five municipalities. Uh, after the project was finished, the vendor uh, product made a product offering out of this uh, platform uh, and are offering it as a software, as a service uh, and also further development of the product uh, as, well, traditional procurement. Uh, it is very popular, it has now over 180 municipalities as customers. Is it really open though? Um, well, two years after it had been established on the market, uh, in 2016, the first concerns was raised by other people outside of the vendors organization that would like to try to contribute to the platform. Uh, it was not possible uh, due to a lot of technical depth built in the solution. For instance, there was no uh, uh, no way to know exactly which repositories was building a complete platform. There were no dependency management. That's just one of the main, but maybe the biggest problems. Uh, in 2019, it was a report written about all the technical depth in the platform from another vendor who would like to do business on this platform as well, but uh, when they tried to uh, download it, build it, they saw that well, it's actually possible. Uh, and we in the municipality of Sonsvall uh, was also aiming for contributing to this platform ourselves with our own developers, who also found it uh, impossible and also wrote a report about it and not knowing that this report from 2019 was uh, already done and they were very similar uh, addressing the same issues uh, this was highlighted to the vendor of open platform of, well in several occasions from 2016 to uh, is lost uh, before Christmas now uh, report. Uh, no actions are taken really from their point of view and why should they? I know, I mean, they, they are driving their business on their product built on this open source uh, code. Uh, so it's, it's really a single vendor model uh, 
We have a license with but only one possible vendor that can contribute to the to the system. Uh, and what can we learn from that? Well, we, we can't really hope for the vendor's goodwill to actively drive the open source project to attract more vendors because, well, why should they? Uh, that's not that's not in their business best interest, I guess. Uh, I mean, it's perfectly okay to package a product offering from this code. Uh, the main issue is really that there has been no <coughs> no part of the municipality sector that has actually really uh, taking over ownership of this open source project. They have just uh, left it in the hands of the vendor and the vendor are doing their business and we are, we are stuck uh, totally locked into this vendor. So this is an example when it doesn't work in one sense where <coughs> the vendor is kind of hijacking the open source project and lock in the customers to the project. Uh, but we, on the other way around then, what the things that we ourselves, ourselves are developing, um, for instance, um, we in the municipality in Sundsvall have invested heavily in developing reusable components for the last two years, uh, a microservice ecosystem, and uh, some and, uh, web applications integrating in that ecosystem. It's all out there uh, on GitHub. We actually uh, have had quite a lot of interest in what we are doing from other municipalities, but does anyone else contribute? Does anyone fork it? Does anyone use it in some way? No. Why not? And here it becomes interesting. Um, why is it so hard? Um, my, uh, my, my thoughts about this is that, well, a lot of other municipalities are really interested, they would really need this as well because uh, they have an old, uh, an old shitty IT environment today with a lot of lock-in effects, uh, costing a lot of money, uh, do not uh, make it possible for efficient operations. Uh, the interest is very high, but they don't have the competence or the resources within the organization. That's a very lot of our municipalities. The ones who have resources are a Microsoft the municipality, and we are building Java, so that doesn't work. And we also have this not invented here thing that, well, it looks, this looks nice, but we, we would like to do it our own way. Yeah. Should I follow? Cool. Um, so, uh, as, uh, as Pelle says, there, there's, we have an issue with municipalities. I mean, you can't expect a municipality of 5,000 inhabitants to have the competency or the capability to to do innovation procurement, to know what an open source license is, to know where to look for open source offerings, to, to, um, to be knowledgeable about requirements engineering and how to avoid these lock-in effects. Uh, they have a, a strong dependency on external, um, external consultants uh, employing and helping with this collaboration, I know you. So, so I'll have a, a tight collaboration with, is it Unge? Or, yeah. Uh, where they are much smaller, while well, you have the muscle and the capabilities um, being a mid-sized yeah, there, there, yeah. there, there are some 
islands out there with collaborations, but uh, they are quite new and often quite specific as well. I think the Sundsvall Ongay case is extremely unique in that sense that uh, the goal is to move the complete IT of Ongay into Sundsvall. That, so that, that, that's a really unique case. But all the other islands out there are, well, maybe they are solving one small part for three, four municipalities, but in the, in the whole, it's still this uh, kind of mess. <laughs> and then we have this uncertainty and lack of practice in how to consider open source as part of the acquisition process or the procurement process. Um, I know in Italy, I think they introduced the law in 2012. Uh, some of them may, may correct me, but basically stipulating that yeah, they have to consider open source first. But it wasn't until 2019, something, 2020, when they created uh, a first draft of their national procurement guidelines on how to actually consider open source in the acquisition process, that they actually started to see some effect on the law introduced almost eight, nine years ago. So there is a need for, for practice, for guidance, for processes here. For example, how to evaluate total cost of ownership, evaluate the security or maintenance or the health of a project, comparing open alternatives towards each other, against each other, uh, and also closed proprietary. So here, here we have a lot of things to develop. There, are a lot, there is a lot of knowledge, but it needs to be introduced and contextualized to the public context. Um, another thing is the discoverability of open source. Uh, knowing that there is open alternatives out there, actually asking the question, um, and now we're starting to see this rise of, of software catalogs across different nations and now also on an aggregated European level. And we have a, a Swedish uh, example of Authentico.se where we try to list um, open source software projects used by uh, different public agencies in, in Sweden on the different levels, maintained by Jonas Söderberg, uh, who's uh, going to talk next. So again, um, and um, we also have this, um, this big issue that a lot of municipalities are really locked in long time. Uh, I know Björn in the audience here has done a lot of research on this. I, I talked to Uppsala municipality before this autumn. They have just entered a 20-year agreement. I won't mention the provider, but to a, a service uh, management system for social services. And just after six months, they've already started developing a new system on the side where they can load over the data and actually start doing the reports that they actually need. And this is just after six months into a 20-year deal. So, it's an issue. Um, another issue is that, yeah, as you are, municipalities are quite limited in resource. It's quite convenient to look at the neighboring municipality and see use the same documentation and uh, look at the same systems that they are using and hence there might be that it, uh, a procurement acquisition process becomes biased towards certain vendors or solutions. And then there's also this cultural and knowledge aspects about different fears, um, both legal but also security. When I talk to different public administrations and also large administrations with 600 plus people in uh, IT departments. It's typically the IT or cyber security that's coming and bashing down the, the, the question, should we use this or can we use this or can we release this open source? Typically, the, the, what's done by the legal side in, in, in the industry. Um, and also this risk of a person as not knowing what open source is, will it function? I mean, municipalities, they, bet, they just want to go about with what they're doing. They don't want disruptions. So this risk of destroying or interrupting what is that is working, again, that's one factor that renders in these very long uh, lockings. Um, also lack from from uh, the management level or the political uh, policy level. As we can see also important in, in the industry, you need the support of C-level 
to, to introduce these uh, policies and so on. And um, yeah, as we've seen in, um, in uh, opening, there is a need for coordination, for collaboration, for resource pooling, but there isn't any. But there is potentials, like Sundsvalle and you're collaborating with, collaborating with Ongen, and there is potential, for example, in the opening user uh, association, where you have these 180, 200 almost municipalities gathering, um, but still lacking the technical knowledge and the possibility and awareness to actually drive the development and, and see the potential risks and how to manage them and mitigate them. Yeah. And, uh... One thing about that, uh, the user open it platform, uh, user group, uh, most, most of the customers doesn't really realize that they have bought something that is open source. That's something we have uh, struggled, struggled with in that uh, organization. Uh, they didn't understand at all why we published uh, this report on open platform and trying to well, modernize and drive change. So why? We have just bought the uh, product in the cloud and using it. So a lot of knowledge that is missing even, even there where they are quite technical in a way. So, how have others done it? There are good examples out there um, to different level, on different levels of maturity. Yeah, quick question. Uh, I was uh, kind of going to add to the, this, why is it so hard, is that uh, also software we use just is very, very hard. And uh, very often it's uh, kind of it's a tremendous amount of work to try to match the, the existing software components to what you're trying to achieve. It's very often that taking a component that is, for example, some kind of generic reservation system incurs a great risk of having it really difficult to customize with respect to some specific thing. And, and that's a kind of it's not uh, particular to municipalities, it's a more generic problem, but it's uh, especially painful for municipalities sometimes because they kind of don't have any kind of expertise for that kind of mix and match. So from my point of view, uh, buying open source by accident is actually a great win because then someone else has done the mixing and matching of existing solutions and what they are trying to procure. Definitely. I mean, doing innovation procurement or innovation friendly procurement when adapting an existing solution to, yeah, to like, the needs. It's yeah, like for instance, someone's asking for a... Uh, we have... <laughs> so, I mean, uh -huh, okay. uh, so an example of a case like this is when uh, uh, some municipality procures just using normal normal process uh, kind of uh, citizen participation platform and the company that uh, wins the procurement uh, uses actually the city underneath or something like that. So that's, uh, in my opinion, that's a very good case, even if the municipality doesn't know if they're using open source because then someone else has done all that trouble of trying to find the good components to use for the product. And they are also taking the risk of maybe having it difficult to customize to some specific case. So yeah. Thanks for that. Um, so next we we're going to drop into some, uh, some examples out there of how more, more ma under examples to different levels of maturity and how do you, you can achieve this kind of collaboration. One example is if we look into Denmark, there is an, uh, a municipal uh, resource association based on what you could resemble to uh, a soft, open source software foundation. 
that's driven by the municipalities. They have about 70 plus, but also some uh, regions and uh, public administrations. So here, one or two or three municipalities can come together and initiate an idea, and they have an on ground for developing these products, and they have a very tight collaboration with an ecosystem of vendors where they do the procurement for the more larger uh, municipalities in the association. And the vendors in the ecosystem have signed a, me uh, a memorandum of understanding, acknowledging that what is produced has to be open, uh, uh, have, have these different hygiene factors fulfilled. It has to be on a public but it has to be this open source license, the copper had to be transferred, uh, all of these, so in terms of documentation and so on, knowing that there should be a possibility for others, competing vendors, to come in and also do the work. So typically they have one vendor doing the development and another vendor doing the quality assurance and so on, so trying to have an, uh, an open uh, interaction. Um, and then for each for each um, project, they, they put together a technical committee uh, with architects, people from the different uh, user municipalities, and they have they, they have a standard funding arrangement. I think there are two actually, um, where the main one is depending on your size. If you're large, medium, small, then you pay a different amount to the um, maintenance and development to to be procured. Another example is from the, the Czech Republic where you have this more civil society foundation uh, called Open Cities. Um, they are gathering today about 20 uh, cities. They, on the contrary, receive today at least uh, open source software projects to host them uh, compared to OS2, which uh, actually initiates them. This association helps facilitate a joint collaborative performance engineering uh, process. They currently host three projects where Cdivisor is the, the largest in 2016, a visualization platform for public spending in the municipalities. They collaborate both with the Civil Tech Society but also the different hacker communities and here with the city of Prague is the lead user where they collaborate a lot with a public, public owned service provider that does a lot of the development. Another way is in, the, in the, the context of Paris, where they have this, lead, you can call them a lead user, where they have been developing a lead test, a lead service platform today with a, a, an ecosystem of 400 plugins. Um, so they've been developing this since the beginning of the 2000s, and up and down they've been trying to grow this community, but now they are getting better. Um, so they have a really this big IT department doing the development and helping other municipalities to onboard. And they're also now doing a containerized version and offering as a service for other municipalities to more easily check in. Another example is where you have municipalities come together and co-owning uh, a service provider as in the, in the context of Community Loan, an open source project that developed for some years now. It was initiated by, by two developers, two, two um, what do you call it, fire souls, to, to engage people from two different municipalities. Um, and then it's it grown and and um, formed the foundation for this co-owned service provider Imio, now owned by 120 Valenian municipalities. So they facilitate the collaborative requirements, requirements engineering process and do the future development funded by the municipalities. Another example is where you go from this more project in the wild, like Signalen. Um, a tool for creating, ascending, receiving, handling reports in the public space in the Netherlands. They were, uh, supported by the Foundation for Public Code initially, I think also still young, but maybe quite some input there. Um, initially, a lot of the development is done by Amsterdam, the city of Amsterdam. They have a lot of muscle, uh, and still is to some part. And now it's gone from the wild into the um, Dutch Esquad, or Association for Municipalities. A uh, pre existing association um, where they now try to host the project and find this model and how this could scale and potentially also be a foundation of other products sooner or later, like OS2, for example. Like I said, Amsterdam is still doing a lot of the development, but they're trying to step back a lot of others and they're also trying to onboard more vendors. <coughs> so, what can we learn? 
there is an, a large need for coordinated action for resource pooling, for knowledge sharing, um, joint ownership of the, the code and the deliverables, uh, and thoughtful decisions on the types of licenses to avoid lock-ins, such as de facto lock-in, even though something can be open source, you can actually be locked in to uh, a specific vendor. Um, there needs to be repeatable, frictionless uh, on-ramps for new projects, governance setups, sustainable funding models. Um, that, so new municipalities can easily jack in without having to understand so much of the technical fussiness. There needs to be an engagement from service providers, suppliers. There needs to be an engagement because they are a big foundation in building these communities around public sector open source projects as the typical municipality or public administration don't have the development capacity as soon as for example. So the development is most probably conducted through suppliers or vendors. Um, and we need to lower barriers to adoption and community engagement. Yeah, and uh, I mean, all of the investments we have made, uh, which I think uh, if we got to if we really spread the usage of what we have built, we can actually save them welfare, um, or, or at least be a part of saving the welfare. But we, we in some sort of now we we can't do more than we have done. We don't have the resources to actually do all this. Uh, there we need some uh, SKR or Inera or some some other organization that actually just take our hold and promote it, kind of. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so now I guess we have time for one, maybe two questions, so... I see a lot of uh, organizations have failed when it comes to creating open source. I don't know about your projects, I have, I've read about them, but I don't know about, about the details. But I think the, the biggest mistake organizations do is that they don't understand that good open source software is it's 100% community. Uh, and I almost want you to reverse the thinking that we need to start with the community. You need to find a common ground, and I think what they, what they do in Denmark is kind of relating to that. They they collide, they start with a group of organizations to create something because great open source software is very generic. It's adoptable, and what a lot of people do is, is just code dumping on the internet of ready-made software, or ready-made systems. So other organizations, when they go and see, it's like, oh, you, it, there is even their logo here. We don't need that. So it's like, it's not generic enough. So, so it's not a complaint to you guys, but, but it's really, on a general level, I see, it, see this all the time. So can, what's your kind of opinion in, in this case? Especially uh, to you, from my point of view, we, uh, we need to say the welfare in municipality of Sundsvall, we, we, we needed to invest in all this development anyway, uh, just to <coughs> kind of save our own operations, uh, so we would have built it anyway. Now we see that we, we, are, we are really aiming for generic scalable solu solutions, we are adding quite a lot of effort in that. And hopefully it, it's good enough for other municipalities to use. I, at least I think so. Uh, maybe not every microservice, but at least part of them solving part of problems, for instance, sending out digital posts and stuff like that. Uh, so, I mean, that's why we have started the other way around. Now we have a lot of code that hopefully is scalable to Kickstart the community. That's my 
what, what I'm thinking. Okay, we have one more question. Possibly also for Kai. Uh, you are one of the few municipalities that have a policy for open source. Is that because you have a courageous CIO or do you have an enlightened uh, municipal council? Uh, it's because we have a unique uh, CIO, uh, I want to say, uh, and uh, he has made a tremendous job to uh, to sell uh, digitalization and uh, in-house development to our politicians, so we have all this all this investment money that I spend kind of. Yeah, it's it's that. Uh, he was the game changer when he started at the municipality. Otherwise, we would, I wouldn't work there either if he wasn't there. So, yeah, one person. Perfect. And thank you very much. Thanks.